Well, you may be seated. Well, it's great to be together and to celebrate this morning. I love baptism Sundays. As I mentioned earlier, throughout the Old Testament, I feel I'm a little jealous, actually, of God's people in the Old Testament because he gave them all these celebrations, all these festivals to kind of commemorate his love for his people and his deliverance of them and, and, and his call to them. And, and on this side of the cross, I, I, it's why I love Christmas and why I love Easter and why I love celebrating new faith in Christ and why I love baptisms. They are a celebration of what God's done. And we, as the people of God who have been changed by God, get to celebrate what he's doing in the lives of other people. So what an incredible day it is. I want to let you know it is an incredible day. It is a little bit of a hard day, too. Um, so if I don't make it through the sermon without crying, I just want to let you know why. Five years ago today, my son died. Um, and God's good. And one of the things that we celebrate in baptism, and one of the things that I find joy and encouragement even in that story, is that Ethan knew Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So Ethan not only had new life in him on this earth, but Ethan has eternal life with him. And one day I will see my son again. And so today, as we talk about baptism, as we talk about how we celebrate what God's done, let us keep our eyes on, on that hope that baptism points to that one day we will not only see our Savior face to face, but we as the people of God will worship him together. All right, well, let's jump in. A uh, reminder that next Sunday we will, be we will be getting together for those interested uh, on going on our Costa Rica 2024 mission trip. So after this service, next Sunday, join us upstairs in the youth room. Find out what we did two years ago, what we're planning on doing this summer, hear from families who have been, and then find out what the timeline is for joining in that trip in June. It's going to be a great trip as we partner with a local church community in Costa Rica to, to share and make disciples uh, of the people there. All right. Well, over the last couple of weeks, if you've been with us, you know that we've been learning a bit about climbing Mount Everest as kind of this analogy for this mission that God has called us to. Climbing Everest takes thousands of dollars, hundreds of people, and, and not only is it months in advance of training for the climb, but the climb itself is two to three months in the making. It is no easy feat. And we've used that to remind ourselves that as we are called to make disciples, this is no easy task. We don't flip switches and people are made in disciples. We don't simply share the good news of the gospel and walk away. No, what we're called to is the messy work of walking with people, just as Jesus did with his disciples over three years. Well, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, you might remember, were the first to summit Mount Everest in 1953. Over the next 20 years, from 1953 to 1973, only 25 more people summited the mountain. It was that difficult, and it took that much work. Now, with the development in climbing technology and GPS and satellite imagery, since 1973 to today, over 6,600 people have summited Everest. That's a pretty big number when you say that we started just with two people 70 years ago, but it's a very small number in comparison to all the people on the planet. There are 7.8 billion people in the world today, and so 6,600 of them are the 1% of 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 the 1%, of the 1% and I don't actually know where that stops, but it's a very small percentage. If you do the math, it's 0.0000008 of the world's population have experienced standing on the top of Mount Everest. When they do, they take pictures like these to commemorate the successful climb. They mark in their memories and in these photos an accomplishment that they've done. Well, as we celebrate baptism today, we don't celebrate through photos something we've done. We don't celebrate through the act of baptism something we've done. But it was said a few minutes ago, in baptism we celebrate something that God has done. We declare that salvation in Jesus Christ is through Christ alone, and the new life we've experienced in him was the gift of the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the new identity we have in Him. Well, I'm excited to unpack this with you this morning. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we get started? 
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the chance to, to celebrate what you're doing in the lives of your children, in the life of Abigail, in the life of Brandon, and, and knowing that they represent the life of so many who have been changed by you. So Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, you know that this morning my head and my heart are in lots of different places. So I just pray for strength this morning. Um, Lord, I pray that you would speak. Lord, I thank you that you work through imperfect vessels, that Abigail and Brandon aren't going to get it right as they seek to faithfully follow you, and yet you will work through them as they faithfully follow you. So Lord, I just pray this morning, uh, whether it's with tears or just confused words or whatever, I pray that you would speak. I pray that you would work, Lord, that we might love and and fall in love with and, and understand at a deeper level the beauty of the thing that you called your disciples to, to baptize others who have come to follow you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, thank you that you're with us. Thank you for the chance that we have to hear from you in your word this morning. Pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we've been walking through Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're taking a close dive in at this mission that Jesus has called us to. It's been called the Great Commission. It it really is our calling on this side of the cross. For those who've chosen to place their faith in Jesus Christ, this is what our lives are to be about until we see him face to face. It's why we and believers around the world will join together today in in worship and in services to to worship him and to to be baptized, to baptize fellow believers is because of what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Well, three weeks ago, I I gave you the challenge of memorizing Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And I'm gonna give you a little grace. I'm not gonna ask you to say it this morning, but as I read it, I wanna use you an internal test. Have you committed to memory this month? Next week, maybe we'll say it out loud together. But here you go. How well have you done at memorizing this? And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, hopefully you did pretty well. Hopefully you've been reflecting on this verse and committing it to memory and I encourage you to if you haven't. Well, as we've unpacked the message this month, there's a couple of key things we've observed through the, the first few verses of this passage. First, we notice the context, that the mission that, God is, that Jesus is calling his disciples to continues the ministry that had begun in Galilee. For in Galilee, Jesus called his disciples to follow him, and Jesus performed his first miracles. Second, we're reminded that the mission we are called to is undertaken on the basis of Jesus' authority, his strength and his power, his rule over all things, not our own strength or our own power. We're reminded that this is what the therefore is, therefore, in verse 19, that because of what Jesus has done, we can go out on this mission to make disciples. And then we were reminded, of course, last week that that is our call, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We're called to train, to instruct, to show others what it means to follow him and what he means in our lives. We notice that this is the only verb in verses 19 through 20. That the only action is make disciples and everything else is kind of helping us understand what it means to make disciples. And we noticed last week that this is not making disciples of us. This is not disciples of Terry. This is not disciples of Dan. This is not disciples of Brad. This is disciples of Jesus. Our call is to make followers of Jesus Christ, not little, little um, followers of us. Well, as we jump in today, I, I want to pose a thought to us. Uh, and we're a, a, a culture and a, and a people that like processes, and so I'm going to give you a caution here in a second. But I think we maybe can look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and see maybe a, a bit of a process here. What if in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, step one is the going? It's the actually going to all people, all nations, and telling them about Jesus, showing them what it means to follow him, taking the good news everywhere. And then what if that leads to step two, to people placing their faith in Jesus Christ, and, and then the call to baptize is the public declaration that that has happened in someone's life. And so as a result, They've seen what it means to follow Jesus. They've decided to follow Jesus, and now they need to know what it means or looks like to walk with him. And so in step three, we show them what it means to follow Jesus in light of the salvation they found in him. We teach them to observe commands they cannot, they cannot observe without Jesus Christ in their life. 
I don't think it's a, a bad way, actually, to, to look at this verse. Um, this may resonate with some of us who are more process-oriented, maybe more engineering and perspective. And culturally, thank you, Henry Ford, we like assembly line procedures. We like step one, step two, step three. They're not a bad thing, but I do want to give us a word of caution as we move forward with this model. It's not perfect. We need to recognize that seeing this verse as a linear process is something that we do in the West very easily because of the Industrial Revolution. Processes are our jam. They're what we love. But in the first century in which Jesus was teaching and Matthew was writing, it was not a post-industrial world. They did, not have, uh, they did not think of the world so much in linear processes in the way that we do. Sure, there were some that just by life, I mean, a baby is conceived, a baby is born, a baby grows, right? There are some processes in life. But I want to caution us not to hold too fast this formula. And, and here's the reason why. Um, because if we do, this becomes our checklist for performance. We like processes and we like checklists. We like to know what's expected of us, and if I meet those expectations, then I'm fine. But I want to show you a couple problems with seeing this too much of a linear equation. For example, we aren't all called to be missionaries around the world. Some of us, as we looked at last week, are called to simply be faithful to our children and our communities around us as God brings the nations to us. The fact that that piece looks different for each follower of Christ does not disqualify any of us. I have a dear friend, and now I'm ad-libbing, which is always dangerous. I have a dear older gentleman in Northern Ireland. Um, his name's Stanley. Stanley desperately wanted to be a missionary around the world. And God made it very clear he was not to be a missionary around the world. He was to be a businessman. Stanley had one of the most successful businesses in Northern Ireland, and he used that money to send others to do the things he desired to do. But Stanley had a tremendous impact in Northern Ireland and still does to this day. He was no less faithful in this call to make disciples simply because he didn't leave his country he was still faithful to make disciples in his country. Similarly, if we don't ever get the chance to baptize someone or see someone place their faith in Jesus Christ, that doesn't make us a lesser Christian. One of the most sobering stories of missionary journeys around the world is to be a missionary in Japan after the fall of the shogunate. Missionaries that went to Japan in that season and tilling that dark soil never got to baptize a single convert in their life never saw a single person place their faith in Jesus Christ, and yet saw many die for their faith who had gone there. They were no less faithful to the call to make disciples, simply because nobody placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? Today in Japan, yes, it's still a hard place to make disciples, but that work is bearing fruit. So I think making disciples in this step process is helpful, but I want us to guard our hearts and our minds from a failure mentality that says, if I haven't done these three things or seen these three things happen, I somehow am lesser for it as a believer. I want to encourage us that at, at the heart of it is the call to faithfulness. Are you taking the opportunities you have to make disciples? And the results are up to God. All right, well, let's kind of move forward with this model with that caveat. The step one that we looked at last week was to go and make disciples of all nations. This was the call for each one of us, not just pastors, not just missionaries, not just elders, not just men, not just women, not just adults, but every single one of us who call Christ Savior are called to show and tell others, no matter their race, their creed, their religion, no matter how much they're like us, no matter how much they're different than us, what it means to follow Jesus. As we learned last week, 75, three out of four, up to 90%, 9 out of 10 people come to know Christ because of a relationship with a Christ follower. People come to know Jesus because you're following Jesus and you get to know them. So going is absolutely essential, church. We can't not go and show and tell people. In fact, Paul gets this in Romans 10, and I wanted to share this with you this morning. He says this to the church in Rome, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone going and preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? They're, they're actually told to go. And as is written, and this calls back to Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Church, every single one of us is called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you do, your feet are beautiful as you open the door for people to know who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for them. So the first call is to go. The second call then is, is we hope that as we show people who Jesus is and we tell them about what, what he's done for them, our heart, right, our prayer is that they would place their faith in him as we have. 
And that's where baptizing comes in because they place their faith in him and now they're making a public declaration of an internal decision of what God has done in their life through Jesus Christ. Well, next week we're going to look at teaching and and Eric Fridge will actually be with us next weekend to to walk us through what does it look like to teach others to follow Jesus in this process of making disciples. But for today, let's stop here. We're called to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you've been with us this year, you know it's been an incredible joy over the last 10 months to celebrate what is now 14 baptisms. This this year, we've gotten to celebrate with Caleb and Clayton and Cade Cook as they've uh, declared their faith in Christ through baptism. We've gotten to celebrate with Abijah Castillo and Sawyer Erickson and Arlen Horvath and Rannon Fenninger and Lincoln Good and Justin Ratcliffe and this morning, Abigail Wheeler and Jessica Charlotte and Brandon Gwynn and my daughter, Aubrey, back in April. It's been an awesome year of celebrating changed lives through the truth of God's word and the love of his people as they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we join, as we do this, we join in celebrations around the world. My brother and sister-in-law have served with the International Mission Board with the Southern Baptists for about over a decade now. Uh, They were in the Middle East for a while, then they were in Europe, and now they're in Richmond, Virginia. And I wanted to just give you a glimpse of what baptisms look like around the world because I want us to recognize that what we do this morning in, in worshiping and baptizing is not something you do just in Sugarland. It's what Christians do across the world. So if you're making disciples, <clears throat> sorry, if you're making disciples in a prison in South Africa, you bring a blow-up pool and you baptize disciples in a blow-up pool in a prison in South Africa. If you live in Mozambique, you go to the nearby river and walk down the muddy banks to be baptized. If you're in Botswana and the closest water option is full of crocodiles, well, you improvise and you use bricks and a tarp to create your own baptismal. There's a reason we don't baptize in the ponds. Thank you, alligators. If you are in Southeast Asia where it's actually illegal to convert people to Christianity or to to walk them through that process, then you baptize in a well because it's the place that there's water and you can do it immediately. Well, if you're in Germany and Cambodia and you don't happen to be near a body of water, you baptize in the bathtub or in a makeshift bathtub in a shower. If you're in Austria, you baptize in the Great Danube River. And if you're in Russia, where you officially have to get the state's permission to baptize people, you baptize them in a nearby lake. These believers, those being baptized this morning, join us, those of us who have been baptized and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, in a a call to obedience, to, to follow Jesus Christ, to repent and be baptized. But the question remains, what is baptism? It's not an English word. It's not very common. It's not one that you're gonna use in your daily conversation with people. In fact, it's really just a Greek word that we've brought over into our English language. What is it? And maybe you've been having this question, actually, this conversation with your kids. I know several of us with young kids have been, as they've seen their friends baptized. Mom and Dad, I want to get baptized. Like, what is that? And we're walking through that with our kids. So perhaps if that's you, here's a story you can relate to. There's a story told of a father who was talking to his eldest son who was preparing to be baptized, and he was wanting to understand the significance of what he was doing, and so he took great care in sharing it with his son. Well, while they were talking, the four-year-old sibling, little brother, was listening in. And all of a sudden, he left the room very upset. Dad was curious, like, what's going on? So dad runs after him and says, hey, what's going on? And the little boy, through tear-filled eyes, says, I want to be alphabetized with my brother. (laughs) Right? Some of us don't know the difference between alphabetized and baptized because all we've seen is that you do this thing with water, but what's the significance of it? Heard a story during the break this morning um, from... Betty and Kent Berenger, when they got baptized, they did it with their grandkids because they wanted their grandkids to know that mom and dad had placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And one of their grandkids said, Grandma and Grandpa, I want to be baptized too because it looks like a bath, right? We all have these things that we're trying to wrestle with. What is it? So that's the question we want to answer today. What is baptism? Is it just one more thing churches do like singing and serving and sending? What makes it so significant and special? Well, on the most basic level, baptism is a washing with water. We see it practiced here in Matthew 3 that we'll look at next month, in which Jesus comes down to the Jordan and is baptized by John the Baptist. With the Great Commission we're looking at this month, baptism becomes a central part of the life of his disciples. In Acts 2, Peter preaches to the crowds at Pentecost, and he says, you want to, they ask him, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. 
And that day, 3,000 people were baptized and added to the number of believers. In Acts 8, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch along a road. When they find a body of water, they just stop at it, and the eunuch says, well, can't I be baptized here? What we learn in that story is it doesn't really matter where you're getting baptized because it's not about the water or the location, and we'll talk more about that in a second. In Acts 11, where we're reminded that baptism is for all people, for a Roman centurion, the, the very authorities that put Jesus on the cross, not Cornelius himself, but he represented the, 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 the government that did, he and his entire household hear from Peter about Jesus, they believe, and they are baptized. Well, in Acts 22, when Peter, when, when the crowd is clamoring for Peter's, or, sorry, for Paul's death in Jerusalem, uh, Paul's testimony is that Ananias, uh, who God used to restore his sight in Damascus, told Paul, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so it seems that Paul was baptized in Damascus by Ananias. Throughout the ages, Christians have recognized that baptism is one of two key practices that Jesus calls us to, communion and baptism. Here at Cornerstone, we call them our symbols of grace. They are things that remind us and reflect to us the grace that God has shown us through Jesus Christ. In communion, we, we reflect on the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That there was nothing we could do to pay that price. He paid that for us. And in baptism, we celebrate the new life he has given us. But we also celebrate, as we've seen in these passages, a washing away of our sins. That this, this physical um, water reflects a spiritual truth about what's happened in our lives. Well, as you unpack what the scripture says about baptism, you're going to notice a lot of different things. Today, I just want to focus on three, and I'm actually going to primarily focus on the first one. Baptism is a visible reflection of what Jesus has done in the life of the individual. Baptism is a public declaration of that individual's faith in Jesus Christ. And baptism is an identification with the body of Christ, the church, of which the person is now a member. So let's start unpacking the first one. Baptism is a visible reflection of what Jesus has done in the life of, a, of the individual. It is, an inter, it is a reflection of an internal and eternal impact reality of their new life in Christ. For Christ died to take our place. He took our sin on the cross. He died the death we deserved as both our substitute and our atonement, as well as several other things, our ransom and those things. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, we're trusting and believing in him as the only way to reconcile us to a holy God. Not through our best efforts or our own strength can we be reconciled, can we pay for our sin, can we undo our sin, can we do that which is right. It is only through Jesus Christ that we are saved from our sins. And it is only through Jesus Christ that we are made righteous before God. In that same passage in Acts 22, Paul will refer to the people, inviting them to, to repent and be baptized. He will say, your sins, that your sins might be washed away. What's beautiful about this imagery of, of baptism is, is that there's a truth here, and the truth here is that what was is now gone. This sin that defined you and your relationship with God has been washed away. Not washed away by anything you've done, but washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And it's more than that. It's the sins have been washed away. And in that, the, the New Testament speaks about as we have died to our old way of life. Not only have our sins that we've committed been washed away, but the life we lived is, is now dead. It's behind us. And we now are given a new life in Christ in which Christ places Holy Spirit in us and we're called sons and daughters of God. I want to walk you through a few passages, the ways that Paul explains this to believers. Let's look at Romans 6 first. In Romans 6, 3 through 4, here's how Paul explains this reality that baptism reflects to the believers in Rome. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul here says there's two realities that are happening in baptism. You are baptized into his death. You died with him. And just as the father raised the son back to life, you are walking in newness of life. There is something profound that has taken place in placing your faith in Jesus Christ, that you are no longer the person you were. You are a new creation. Just a few verses later in the same chapter, Paul writes this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free 
from sin. Now, church, many of us still walk in sin because we have habits of the mind and habits of thinking. We've, we've got ruts we slip into. But the beautiful declaration of the New Testament is we are no longer slaves to that sin. Not only has the price been paid, but in Christ we are freed from that bondage. And we are called now to walk in the reality of our newness of life. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul puts it this way, 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So church, baptism is a visible or outward representation of this internal and eternal reality. Our sins have been washed away, yes, but we, our old life has been dealt with, and we now walk in newness of life in him. A life that is now clothed in the righteousness of Christ, not in our own, and we can walk in the power and the freedom that Christ bought us on the cross. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our old self is dead and our sin has been put to death and we've been given new life. And so this morning as we baptized Abigail and Brandon, and you'll see this in baptism, there's two things we typically say at a baptism. One is you've been buried with Christ in baptism, and you've been raised to newness of life. Uh, the very physical act of baptism not only is the washing away of sin, but the death of your old self and the raising of your new life in Christ. The other thing, though, you'll notice in Matthew 28, 18, 19, that Jesus has baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Throughout the history of the church, baptism has been done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because what has happened here in a life change was not my work as a pastor. It was not the work of a disciple or a mom and dad. It was not even the work of the one being baptized. It was the work of a holy, good God. The Heavenly Father came down and made a way through His Son and through the power of the Holy Spirit. This person has been given new life through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the work that we celebrate in baptism is the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, this is the amazing news that we celebrate in baptism, that Jesus has taken our sin, and in its place we have been given a new life, no longer slaves to sin. And as a result, our names are written in the book of life forever. Not only are we given a new life in this life, but we have an eternal life that we've been given as well. Oftentimes as I preach, I want to try to connect you guys back to the Old Testament because I think it's too easy to say, well, there's the New Testament, there's the Old Testament, never shall the twain meet. But there's this beautiful thing that God's doing throughout the whole of Scripture. And so I came across this passage that I think shows us, reflects, points to the beautiful thing that God has done in baptism. In Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel, uh, the Lord through Ezekiel says this to his people. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Through faith in Jesus, we are given a new heart, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are given a new spirit, his spirit in us. Our heart of stone, our old life that was dead in our sins and, and, and transgressions our, and our trespasses ha has been dealt with. And our new life has a new heart and a new spirit that results in a changed life. James Comper Gray was a, a preacher and a, and a writer back in the 1800s. And, and he wrote a, a series of books on kind of what was happening in the mission world then. And, and he wrote about Madagascar. For there were a lot coming to know Jesus and be baptized in Madagascar at the end of the 1800s. And he writes that it was often asked of those who would say, hey, I want to be baptized. They would say, well, what first led you to think of becoming a Christian? Now, because you know the stats, this won't surprise you, but you need to know that it's been true for 2,000 years. People come to know Jesus through Christ followers. But the answer he was usually the changed conduct of others who become followers of Christ was what first caught their attention. Here's what they would say. He said, I, I knew this man to be a thief. I, that one to be a drunkard, and the other one a very cruel and unkind to his family. And now they're all changed. The thief is an honest man. The drunkard is sober and respectable, and the other is gentle and kind in his home. There must be something in a religion that can work such changes. And what worked such changes was the new life they had found in Jesus Christ. I know personally, this is the testimony of many of you, that your life before Christ is noticeably different than your life after Christ because of the new life he has given you. 
You're not enslaved in the same way the sins you used to be. You're not entangled in the same things you used to be. The weight is not as oppressive as it used to be because of the joy and the new life you found in Jesus. I've actually seen this truth play out in the life of my own kids as well. As young as they are, as they've placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I've noticed a change in their attitudes towards God, towards his word, toward others, and towards their own sin. I think it can only come about because they have new life in Christ and the Holy Spirit is at work in their life. Singer-songwriter Matt Mayer released a, a, a popular song a year ago in 2022 called The In-Between. In that song, he reminds us of the truth that our lives are changed when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what the song says. From death to life, from darkness to a shine, from fear to a peace I can't explain, from doubts to a hope, holding on and letting go of all the empty promises of shame. I was one way, but now I am different. There was a clear change in a holy collision. Who I was and who I'll forever be. And he was the in-between. Jesus changes our lives forever when we place our faith in him. So church, baptism is a visual reflection of what God has done internally and eternally in the life of a believer. Their sins have been washed away, they've, been, they've died with him, and they've been raised to newness of life. And so I would be remiss if I didn't stop at this, question, this, this point and ask the simple question, do you know that new life? Can you distinctly say I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and my old life is dead and my new life is what I'm walking in? Do you know the joy of, of looking at your old self and saying that's the way I used to be until I met him? And do you know the beauty of looking at a new life in him in which you're no longer slaves to sin and you get to walk in the glorious hope both of eternity and a life with him today? I hope so. I hope you know that. More than anything else, I hope that's true of you. And if you don't, you can today. You can place your faith in Jesus Christ today and that old self is washed away and you're given new life in him. The second follow-up question that we've got to ask today is if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ but you've never been baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do so. Here at Cornerstone, we, we believe strongly in believer's baptism. For all the reasons I've just explained to you, for baptism is meant to reflect an individual's decision to follow Christ and what God has done in their life, to place their faith in him. Uh, uh, baptism is not a promise of something to come that you hope will become true. Baptism is not something we've done on the basis and faith of someone else. Baptism is what we do to declare what God has done in our lives. No, baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is the first step in obedience, a proclamation of what he has done. Baptism serves as a signpost of your new life in Christ. It's your Ebenezer stone that you'll always look back to and say, Christ changed me. I'm a new creation and the old has passed away and the new has come. You know, in the photos of those who have summited Everest are keepsakes of that feat, and they hold on to them. Baptism is a commemoration of what, of what has been done for us in and through Christ. But here's the thing we need to note. Yes, it reflects an eternal and internal reality between us and the Lord, but we don't have to be baptized for that reality to be true. So baptism is something more than just a representation. A baptism is a public declaration of what God has done in our lives and is an identification with God's people. These are the last two we'll look at briefly. Baptism is a public answer to the call to, of Jesus to follow him, take up your cross and follow me, or it echoes what Joshua asks to the people in Joshua 24, choose this day whom you will serve. And a believer who, who uh, in obedience is baptized says to the world, I choose to follow Jesus. Above all else, I choose to follow the one who has changed my life. And so at Pentecost nearly 2,000 years ago, when Peter preaches to the crowd, and says, repent and be baptized, 3,000 respond that day, making a public declaration to those gathered who heard the words of Peter saying, we choose to follow Christ. And Acts 2.41 tells us these beautiful words. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. That day, 
3,000 more followers of Christ whose old life had died and new life had begun in him were added to the church in Jerusalem. But let's be very clear. Making a public declaration of faith in Jesus Christ puts a target on our back. Both in a world who Christ is offensive to and an enemy who would love to undermine us and discourage us. For it's not too long in Acts before Christians are hunted down by Saul who will become Paul when he too is met by Jesus and his life is forever changed. But many like Stephen are stoned for their faith and many are imprisoned for their faith and we have to believe that many of those 3,000 on the day of Pentecost were among those martyred for their faith and imprisoned for their faith. And so throughout scripture as we see those respond to the call to repent and believe and be baptized, we need to know that in doing that, in that faithful step of obedience, they are declaring to the world that they serve a different master and calling that world to make the same choice. You see, in making a public declaration of what God has done in our life, we're inviting others to do the same. Baptism is a public display of that decision to follow Jesus. Many of you might have this struggle. I, I don't know how to share the gospel. I don't know how to tell the people about Jesus. That's why we start here. Because in baptism, you're proclaiming the gospel with few words and a powerful image of what God's done in your life. So if you've been baptized, you've shared the gospel. And now you go on sharing the gospel throughout the rest of your life. Open Doors International recently released their world watch list for 2024. It ranks the 50 countries around the world where Christians face the most extreme persecution. The top of that list is North Korea. It has been for years. And there are a few over in the Western Hemisphere, but the majority are here in Africa, Asia, uh, and Asia. According to Open Doors, 365 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith around the world. Church, that's one out of every seven believers in the world face severe persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. In a room about this size, that's 20 to 25 of us would leave this room and face severe persecution for choosing to show up today. For in Africa, it would be one out of every five of us that's over 30 of you in this room. For choosing to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you would leave this room and face severe persecution. If you lived in Asia today, two out of five of us, meaning nearly 60 of us in this room, would be persecuted for following Jesus Christ. In addition, Open Doors reports that nearly 5,000 Christians were killed this year for faith-related reasons, and over 4,000 are imprisoned for their faith. I don't know about you, but I naturally ask a question, well, how do people know who they are? Like, right, we can, we can kind of fly under the radar. We do that pretty well in the West. Like, religion's personal. Let's not, let's not get public about it. The way you know a Christian is a Christian in the rest of the world is because they've been baptized and they've made that public declaration that I'm following Jesus no matter what. And a world around you doesn't like that. So after coming to Christ proclaiming their faith in him, believers around the world risk their lives to make disciples. It's really easy here in Sugarland and Richmond and Rosenberg and in the West to make disciples kind of as a side gig. These parts of the world, you make disciples because you know your life is on the line, but you've been changed so profoundly by Christ, you have no other thing that you can do. After coming to Christ, beginning with baptism and continuing until the, see, the day we see Jesus face to face, we are called to make disciples, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, of what Jesus has done in our life and what he offers to all those who have placed their faith in him. And we do it alongside brothers and sisters around the world who are dying for proclaiming the very same message. So church, this is our mission. We are called to go and make disciples and, and, and with the hope that they would come to place their faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized as a visual declaration and representation of what God's done in their life, that the world might know they follow him and that they and the world would know that they are part of us, the body of Jesus Christ. So the question for us this morning is, is that the desire of our hearts? Do, does our heart tick? Does our heart chase this? To, to make disciples of all people, to see them baptized into the faith, that they might know the newness of life in Christ, to have their sins washed away and walk with him. 
And then when they do, do we celebrate? For there is no greater moment in the life of an individual than the new life they have found in Jesus Christ. Here at Cornerstone we do, and we always will. This will always be a part of what we do because it's what we're called to do. So we proclaim the gospel through baptism. We declare the decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we are counted among the followers of Christ as we do so. Church, I pray that we will step up to this mission. We will continue in the call that we've been given that we might faithfully make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the chance to open your word together today. I thank you for the reminder it's been of the incredible good news of what you've done in our life as those who have placed our faith in you. Lord, I thank you for the testimony of Brandon and just walking with him yesterday and knowing the work you've been doing in his life as he's walked with you this year. Lord, I thank you for the testimonies of so many in this room who have experienced that washing away of sins, that death of their old life, and walking in newness of life. Now, Father, we know through the rest of the New Testament that walking as one of your disciples is not an easy task. We will fall back into ruts. We will struggle. We will fight the the lies of the enemy and the lies of our hearts. But, Father, we know that we do that in new life, freed from sin and with the presence of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I just pray for us as a church. Lord, would you help us to, to make disciples by going and telling, by baptizing those who have placed their faith in you, And Lord, as we'll learn next week, to show them what it means to faithfully follow you. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for the over 4,000 who are imprisoned uh, today for their faith. We pray, Lord, that you would be present with them, that you would give them encouragement, that you would bring your word to their mind, that they might rest in it through the hardest of days. Lord, we pray for those who um, will lose their life today and tomorrow and the week ahead for professing the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that through the Holy Spirit you would give them courage and boldness. That just as Saul came to know you, that those who hold them captive and those who take their life would come to know new life in Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the the chance to be a part of the greatest mission in the entire world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.